Back at it here on the Kaufman Corner Podcast with you as always, uh, the good doctor, Dr. Rainey Gisarely. Uh I am Seren Petro. Thank you for joining us here as we uh, broadcast live. If you are uh, not catching the stream and hearing us here as part of the uh, uh, part of the podcast, a little bit later in the week, we do stream live, generally live, as I was on vacation last week, uh, generally live on Sunday nights at 10 p.m. Central. We're going to talk about the roster tonight. We got news also during the ball game today that Cole Reagans will be your opening day starter. So that's part of the roster that's taking shape. But the battles that have been out there, we're going to go ahead and take a look at it. How is this uh, team shaping up differently than we thought it would going into spring training? A starter, uh, maybe center field, second base. We'll talk about those kind of things. Any surprises looming? Also going to get into the Royals Hall of Fame. They added three new members. We'll talk about whether or not they got it right. It's all coming up right now here on the Kaufman Corner Podcast. You're listening to Kaufman Corner, the most in-depth analysis of the Kansas City Royals, breaking down the Royals like no one else can. Kaufman Corner is hosted by Randy Gisarli and Seren Petro. Randy is a co-founder of Baseball Prospectus, author of Randy and the Royals, and former columnist for Grantland, The Ringer, and The Athletic. Seren is the award-winning afternoon drive host of the program on Sports Radio 810 WHB in Kansas City. Kaufman Corner is proudly brought to you by GAN Asphalt and Concrete, Kansas City's nationally recognized full-service paving and pavement maintenance contractor, making parking lot problems disappear since 1994. Free consultations, no commissions, in-house crews, and every project comes with a written warranty. Find them online at ganasphalt.com or call 816-484-3338. GAN Asphalt and Concrete, one contractor, all things parking lot. Now, here's your hosts, Randy Gisarli and Seren Petro. Thank you, Curtis. Back at it here on the Coffin Corner Podcast. And, uh, Randy, how about it? Uh, we're less than two weeks away. A little surprising how quick the start of the season is uh, sneaking up on us here. I will still never get used to having opening day in March. I know it's been a thing now for going on 25 years, but uh, still still catches up to you, uh, you know, kind of quickly. March 28th, 11 days from today, we have real baseball at Kauffman Stadium, uh, and Colt Reagans will be on the mound. Um, and just in terms of, you know, opening day starter prowess, the Royals might have their best, uh, their best starter on the mound on opening day since... I don't know, at least since James oh, this, Shields, maybe. Okay, that's what I was going to see. How wh- how far back are you going to go? Like, I mean, you- I would. I, I just said it earlier today on Twitter that I I have a feeling. I'm predicting right now. Cole Reagans is healthy. If he can make 30 starts this year, he's going to have the best season by a Royals starter. Not since James Shields, but since Zach Greinke in 2009. I think he has a chance to have the first five win season by a Royals starter uh, in 15 years. So, boom! Right out of the gate, some optimism here. Are you, uh, you don't, you don't think, I mean, you, you've gotten your hopes up before and, and had them dashed. You've also been pessimistic and, you know, you, you've seen the ups and downs and the way baseball can, uh, you know, throw us for a little bit of a, uh, curve. What, uh, you, you really willing to go that far? Well, again, there, I made the one major caveat. If he stays healthy, if Cole Reagan stays healthy, but even that, I mean, I, I heard that part of it. I, what I saw from him last year and what everybody, what, what, it's not just the, the stats. I mean, his stats were the world, really, even in just 12 starts, one of the, one of the best seasons by a Royals pitcher ever. The quality of his stuff, you know, the, the I mean, his fat, upper 90s fastball from the left side, and it might be his third best pitch. What the scouts are saying, what the scouts are saying this spring, what we've seen from him this you know, this spring, I, I think there's a general consensus in the game that this, this guy is going to be on Cy Young ballots if he is healthy. And that's it's really been since James Shields. You know, maybe Danny Duffy, Danny could never get through a full season healthy, but on a start-to-start basis, Reagan's kind of reminds me of Danny Duffy, but like 10% better. And yeah, I mean, if, if, if the optimism about this season begins with Cole Reagan. So just right off the bat, the fact that the Royals announced him as the opening day starter, it seems like a no-brainer in terms of quality of the pitcher. But, you know, in terms of seniority, Michael Walker and Seth Lugo both have, you know, dibs on that. So I give the Royals some credit that, they are they are going into the season emphasizing results. And, you know, Cole Riggins may not have the most seniority on the staff, but he's their best starter. They're going to put their best on the mound on opening day. It's a small thing, but it's a good thing. 
and I'm excited to see him on, uh, you know, a week from Thursday. Uh, again, this afternoon, this evening, I, I didn't see anything not to like, even in giving up some runs there. I didn't, I didn't see any problems in, in what was going on there. But, you know, it's just like, I'm like, is it really? I guess I'm just, maybe it's the pessimism of having root for the Royals most of my lives. But I'm like, I just like, it, I, I still feel like I need to see more uh, to believe that this isn't just a Danny Duffy hot streak. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it, it, um, I mean, look, that is possible, but D- Duffy generally was effective as long as he was healthy. You know, he was never a bad pitcher. He was either really, really good or he was frustratingly average, right? Um, but he was never as good for as long as Cole Reagan was last year. So that, that's one thing. But the other thing is this, my, my, you know, my understanding of the sport now is that when you when a starting pitcher develops like you ride the hot hand because for as long as he's healthy the, the you're going to get the best results from him right now like there's no sense of dreaming on what Cole Riggins could be in three or four or five years no pitcher has that kind of consistency that you can predict what they're going to be three four five years from now so strike when the iron is hot Cole Reagans right now based on what we saw last year is an ace he may it, it may be a, a fleeting top peer period of time that he's a true number one starter, but he's a, he's really the first guy the Royals could lay claim to being a legitimate, a true number one starter in a long time. And you've got to strike when the Aaron has hot. Take advantage of him now. And you know we we've talked about how many innings they should get out of him. You know we did that before. I'm not saying they're going to throw him out there for 240 innings, but go into the season with him as your number one starter every fifth start, six innings at a time, maybe even seven, um, and see where he takes you. Because I think that what one what what he established last year, his performance level, his talent level, he doesn't have to improve upon that. He might, but he doesn't have to. That's the important thing. He just has to be what he was last year and be healthy. And he's gonna he's going to be on like I said on Cy Young ballots, and he's going to be um, a legitimate ace. Yeah, I mean I I love what I'm seeing. There's there's no doubt about it. And I think you know one of the things we said coming in, you know, the way he kind of presented it uh, when we were discussing beforehand, <clears throat> excuse me, was you know how is this thing look different than what we thought it was going to be coming in? You know I, I don't know that we knew what we thought. We, we knew what we hoped Cole Reagans would be. We knew it would be all the best of Cole Reagans. And I think that's certainly been there, right, in Desert Air and all that, that he still looks like an ace. And that's that's an impressive thing uh, to see. So I think you feel like, okay, there's the number one guy in the announcement tonight uh, as we broadcast, as we uh, stream live here on a Sunday night, uh, that he would be the opening day starter. Surprises no one, right? There was no other way to go. The the like. You know, that was expected, correct? It would have been a disappointment. He would, how bad would he have had to have been in spring training to have not been the opening day starter? Well, again, I think the temptation could have very easily been there for the Royals to just go with, you know, their big money free agent signing, Seth Lugo, who's, you know, a veteran and established, been in the majors for a long time, or Michael Waka, who's been in a rotation for, you know, the better part of a decade. Um, you know, the Royals are to some degree victims of their own past, and, you know, they have they have gotten us used to having low expectations. So I would not have been shocked by any means if they had named Walker or Lugo their opening day starter and then saved, you know, Reagan's for the second or third start. And and not even a reflection of his ability, but simply the idea, oh, we don't want to put that much pressure on the guy. You know, he's, you know, barely got a a, a full season in the major leagues. You know, we still think he's our best pitcher, but we're just going to let one of the veterans take that opening day day start. I would have been stuck. I, you know, I, with this organization's history, I can't say I would have been fair. So I'm pleasantly surprised. Um, but the, the, I think the bigger picture here, if you, if you take a step back is you, you mentioned, you know, he's nothing he's done in spring training has, um, you know, made us think that he's, um, not the pitcher he was last year. Like it's, it's been all, uh, all systems go with, with him in spring training. But I would say in general for the pitching stuff, I mean, the number one thing you want to come out of spring training is simply healthy. And, you know, fortunately, at least to this point, and, you know, thank God, let's, let's pray that nothing changes this perception. The Royals have not had any significant injuries to a starter or to a position, an everyday position player. The big, most, their, their biggest injury is probably Carlos Hernandez that they've had in spring training. 
um, which, which, you know, is unfortunate. But given the way he finished last season, I don't think we could be shocked that the Royals can't rely on him to start the year. Uh, John McMillan is still kind of coming back from injury. Um, so, you know, he's going to probably start the, the season either in Arizona or maybe in AAA. Um, but that's not a huge shock. Um, the biggest injury is probably Christian Chamberlain having Tommy John surgery, but I mean, he's a left-handed relief prospect. So really, you know, the Royals from a health standpoint are doing well. Vinny Pasquantino seems to be healthy. There hasn't been any setbacks for him. Um, so just the fact that the Royals are going into the season with basically everybody they expected to be on their opening day roster on their roster, with the exception of Carlos Hernandez, um, is another small but positive sign for for the 2024 season. By the way, I want to cover a couple of things. One, Irish Mac pointing out, as we are live tonight, it is St. Patrick's Day, so happy St. Patty's Day to everybody, and uh, certainly to Irish Mac. Um, I, I There was something about Gabe Middleton. Somebody had about, like, uh, oh, this, this one, uh, Cotman. Who's harder to find, Asa Lacey or Kate Middleton? To which... I, uh, I, Blake, uh, I I smiled and laughed the moment I read this from Blake. He said, Lacey can't even get Photoshopped onto a mouth. So <laughs> I'm sure one of our, one of our, uh, listeners will, will happily Photoshop, uh, do a bad Photoshop of Asa Lacey on a mound with yeah. clear, yeah. E- clear, uh, evidence of, uh, you know, manipulation there. Yeah. Uh, I, I just think that's good stuff. Listen, I do want to point out, we can, close the 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 book on on cole reagan's because it's been all all signs go uh right now so there's not too much meat on that bone but i i, I do think that maybe the bigger statement is because i'll disagree with you that like there was no way when you say there, there was you know really no way they could start anybody else or, or or i'm sorry the way you put it was you know they would go out there and say we think he's our best guy but we're gonna do this wasn't that crap wasn't that a hokey i mean when you've been as dominant I, I, and I agree with you. We saw times like that where it's like, well, we, we got this veteran guy we're going to give it to. It's like, well, he stinks. Like, wh- why is Mark Redman on the mound? Like, you know, but I, I think now, like, I, I would be shocked if this coaching staff, which I think has been groomed by the best people you can be groomed by, not that they're ultimately going to be, we're going to add, I don't know, maybe we will. I hope we will be adding Matt Quattrero's number to the to the wall out there as he grabs five championships in his tenure in Kansas city. But I know he's not a boob, right? The first time like it took 10 minutes for Trey Hillman to prove now this is not going to work. And so it would have been a complete about face. If Matt Quattrero, if he does something stupid, won't you be surprised? You're right. I mean, on, on some on some level, he is paying for the sins of his predecessors that in the, in the sense of the, the low expectations I may have, but, you're, you know, all I'm saying is every 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 time he makes an obvious decision, I'm going to credit him a little bit for not making the non-obvious decision. Because I've seen managers, front office types, whatever, pitching coaches in this organization make the non-obvious and wrong decision. There's one thing if it's not obvious and it turns out to be brilliant, then it's a sign, then it's a sign of genius. The problem is the Royals for so so long were making decisions which went against conventional wisdom and were wrong. And the only way to describe those are blunders, right? When you make a decision that nobody agrees with and everybody is correct and you are wrong in, you know, with, the, with hindsight, that's a blunder. This is not a blunder. This is the, a common sense, sensible decision. And I'm thrilled to see it. So, yes, I mean, I maybe I should stop assuming the worst with Matt Quattrero at the helm. Um, but at the same time, I, I don't want to take it for granted. You know, right. like I'm grateful for having a manager who to this point seems to be able to avoid the obvious mistake. Maybe you'll, you know, everybody makes small mistakes, but he's avoiding the big and obvious mistakes. And this is another example of that. I'm, uh, I'm, I, yeah, I, I, I just think I'm convinced Matt Quattrero knows what he's doing. I, I'm not, I'm not convinced that he's when they get into pennant races or if they're have expectations and they get off to a slow start that he can get them back going again. He's kind of a different cat. And so I, I don't know. I, I, can he lighten the mood when it needs lightning? Can he kick an ass when it needs kicking? I don't know. Is baseball beyond that? Uh, beyond that? Is, is that all uh, eyewash and, and gibberish that doesn't need to be done? I don't know. Um, we'll see. I mean, I look forward to covering him when he has real things to manage. You know, uh, right. last year was 
like you know you know people are calling and saying, i'm like i i have no time no time to take a call about matt quattrero as a as a manager there's just no he has nothing to work with and so this year we'll, we'll get that and so yeah i'm you know i think it was expected reagan's gets the nod you're right there is a history of this organization of doing some some goofy things uh what are you taking away from the position battles like do you have you know center field second base i mean I, jj piccolo said to me you know michael massey's our second baseman but you know, if you look around, if you're a fantasy baseball player, I saw some of the chats in the in the uh, chat room or about fantasy baseball. Like I'm looking at a fantasy baseball depth chart right now for the Kansas City Royals, and they have Adam Frazier listed as the top guy. So like the industry around baseball, the baseball world isn't like, oh yeah, Michael Massey's the guy. Uh, but center field is, is is one we we don't know. Is Kyle Isbell going to be the guy? Is Drew Waters going to be the guy? What's what's the roster going to look like? Um, you know, I, I, I think there's a little more meat on that front. Uh, you know, and, and I'm just curious what you're thinking right now. Yeah. I, I really, I really feel like I'm, I have to take the Royals at their word that the second base job is Michael Massey's, you know, it's, it's his to lose certainly. And he's done nothing in spring training to lose it. I mean, we don't, we obviously don't want to put too much stock in spring training stats. You love spring training numbers. Don't run. Yeah, they're, 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 they mean everything to me, Saran. <laughs> I caress them before I go to bed at night. Um, but I mean, Massey's hitting in spring training, you know, I mean, like as of, you know, I think going to yesterday's game, his OPS was a thousand. Like there's no reason he would lose his job. Adam Frazier's OPS was 557. So based purely on performance, there's no reason that Adam Frazier should get that job. He wasn't signed to be the everyday second baseman. He was, he was signed to be a, a super utility guy. I, I'll take them at their word for now, but that's how they're going to use him. Uh, I mean, if anything, I, the bigger question is, what do they do with Nick Lofton, who's having actually better string training than both of them? At this point, it you know, I assume he's going back to AAA, um, which, you know, isn't great from the standpoint of, I think he can help this team, but if it means he plays every day and he's the first guy up when they need, you know, if somebody gets hurt or if somebody struggles, they, you know, they, they have, you know, they have depth. That's good. That's, that's not a bad problem to have. Um, I'm fine with that for now. I think center field is really the, um, the, the only position where it's just not certain how it's going to be. I mean, I think Kyle Isabel is going to be in the mix, but will he be full-time starter platoon guy, the fourth outfielder, um, you know, behind Drew Waters. I mean, I, I feel like this team is is better for having Drew Waters on the roster, but trying to come up with a bench when you're limited to only four bench guys is really tough. And I would love, I, I highly doubt it, but I would love to see the Royals go into the season, especially with some extra off days in, in, in the first week or two of the season. Would love to see them go with only 12 pitchers, seven relievers instead of eight. And that gives them a fifth bench spot. And that would allow them to keep Drew Waters as well as Dyron Blanco to go with Garrett Hampson, um, Adam Frazier, and Freddie Fermin. I right, run that run that down again because that was a lot of names there. Yeah. So we know that Freddie Fermin's going to be the backup catcher, you know, health permitting. We know Garrett Hampson is going to be on the roster. We know Adam Frazier, right? There's three bench guys plus the nine starters. That's 12. If the Royals keep 14 position players, that allows them to keep both Waters and Blanco. No chance. I, I'm saying I, I think it's highly no. unlikely, but because I, of the me, early season off days, you don't need eight relievers. Now, most teams will still do that. I'm just saying that is that would be, and again, Matt Quartero coming from the Rays, the, all the analytics background. You want to see him put a, his, his stamp, his analytical progressive stamp on this roster in a season where the roles are hoping to, to actually be competitive, that would be a hell of a flag to plant. It's a small thing, but having an extra position player, knowing that you can still shuttle guys back and forth to Omaha, if you need, you know, a fresh arm in the bullpen, um, you know, it would be re really impressive if they went into the season with seven, seven relievers instead of eight. I don't expect it to happen though. When I sat down very early in spring training, when I sat down uh, Matt Quattrero to, be on the radio show. He said, I, I actually had the, the conversation I'm looking at right now. Teams are limited to carrying 13 pitchers uh, during this time, right? Limited, mm -hmm. right? Not you have to carry 13. And I asked him, like, would you consider not carrying 13? And he looked at me like I was an orangutan. <laughs> like, honestly. And then he's like, I'm not sure. I, and he said to me, I'm not sure I'm following your question. I said, well, the rule is is you're limited to 13. He said, well, you got to carry 13. And I was like, 
I begin to doubt myself. I'm like, oh, geez, I'm an idiot. What did I, you know, you're talking to a guy who asked Brett Main once after a game, how Chad Durbin looked up on the mound. He's like, I don't know. I didn't catch tonight. I'm like, (laughs) (laughs) it wasn't you. Right. So like, I I think I follow it pretty good. I try to stay on top of it. We all make stupid mistakes. I also once asked Dick Vermeil, why he didn't defer the coin toss. And he goes, I don't think you can, can you? And I was, oh. I've come to find out you can't in the NFL. You can now. You couldn't back in Dick Vermeil's days. He's like, that's a college rule, isn't it? I'm like, oh, news to me, right? Like, you can think you know it all. Don't any of us know it all. I I know that very much so. And so I was like, what? And so I, I went back, and I, I, so I brought the rule up again. You're limited to 13, and I, I'm, I'm with you. Like, I think the idea of, like, his mindset, I, I got the vibe that, like, I don't think he did. And then he's like, well, yeah, you, but, I mean, you'd carry 13, right? I mean, I was kind of a little bit like either he didn't know the rule or he was so locked in his head. We're carrying every pitcher we possibly can. That I, I I agree. I mean, I think having some bench flexibility, if you've got a couple of long guys, it'd be great. But I don't think he's got any. I mean, I'll be surprised. You, you might be right there because you're definitely right about all the off days early. But. I'll be surprised if he doesn't have 13 even early. The way the way he answered that question. Oh, I'll, I'll, I would be surprised, but I'm going to be more surprised now that you told me that. Like that that did, that is kind of eye opening. That it just didn't seem to cross his mind that you could do that. That's <laughs> that's well, after just after just praising Matt Quattrero for making all the you know obvious decisions. I guess that's a bridge too far. Still, it's like only carrying seven relievers, which you know is still more than any team carried just 25 years ago. You know, so. Uh, the game, the game has changed, but I just feel like you need that fifth position player. So that, uh, to me, though, the center field is is probably the the biggest question mark right now. Now, the other interesting thing, I don't expect this to happen, but Nick Prado has had a very good spring. I that's the one I wanted to get to. Yeah. Well, is, I mean, can they can they not touch the hot stove, or or do they? Yes, yeah, see, they got to touch that orange <laughs> burner. Make sure that it's really hot. Well, my concern is if he makes the roster. I mean, for the I'm not. I, I'd like to see him prove it in Omaha first. But also, it's like if he makes the roster, whose whose job does he take? Does he take Nelson Velasquez's job? And let me go. Velasquez hasn't had a great spring. But again, don't I don't care about spring training results. Like you, when you make a decision, like you when you flip flop players based purely on what happens in Arizona in March, ninety percent of the time. You make the you, know, you make the wrong choice, whatever it is. Eighty percent of the time, if it's just based on numbers. Now, Prado, what's interesting about him in twenty-seven plate appearances? Yeah, he's hitting four hundred. I don't care about the performance. One walk, four strikeouts. So you know, Nick Prado is that very rare Royals player who actually the you know the data will suggest he takes too many pitches. So I don't like that his walk rate is down, but four strikeouts. Maybe mine, Randy. Do you want these guys taking pitches or not? <laughs> Well, at the when 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 it leads to a forty percent strikeout rate like Nick Prado has had, then no, I don't like that's what I'm saying. Four strikeouts in twenty seven plate appearances again, extremely small sample size. But there's evi- you know, there's a suggestion there that he is making better contact because he's not taking as many hitable. Like he's he's swinging away when the pitch is in the strike zone. Um, that is not only a good sign, but that's a necessary adjustment. He has to make if he's ever going to be a productive major league hitter. His strikeout rates have just been, you know, at a, at a level that is untenable with major league existence. So that part is good. I still think strongly he should go to Omaha and prove that he can make you so, know, much better contact against AAA pitchers, have some success, yeah. and let's look let's look back in May and decide what we want to do with him. So. Um... I want to ask you about that because I agree. I mean, I don't buy it. I could care less what he did in the spring. Go really tear it up in Omaha and I'll feel a little better, but then I want to see it in the big leagues. Sure. But so I, I think that's an easy one to walk away from it. And I think it'll feel old Royalty if it's like, oh, we want to get as many of our high draft picks on the roster as we can. Now, baseball, and it's not a Royals thing. It's the industry of baseball loves touting how many of their draft picks get to the big leagues and, how many games they put in all this, you know, so there's, there's a reason, you know, it's, it's, it's self aggrandizing by bringing him up. And so I, 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 I'll respect them if they send him down, but why is it for Prado? I'll play devil's advocate here. And I'm just curious, you know, when we bring on Joe Sheehan, Joe pulls out what little hair he has left. Sorry, Joe, love your brother. 
uh, about a like mine. Right, a friend of mine. I love him much. Bet you've known him for years. Um, but uh, you know, he he. All the royal signings, you're like, you're just blocking this guy. You're just blocking that guy. Right? Why? Why is it? We're so upset that a Hampson's there, a Frazier's there, because they're blocking Lofton, they're blocking, you know, whoever. But, uh, you know, whatever. Let out with Prado. I mean, what what about what about Lofton says he's got to be on the roster? I mean, he's played his way there, and you seem to be tolerant uh, of them sending him down. You think that's probably where that's happening? Why doesn't Prado get the same kind of treatment? I, I guess I'm confused. He doesn't get the same kind of treatment as a Nicholas. Well, like, yeah, like, 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 you know, you're upset that you and and Joe both kind of agree that some of the signings were blocking us. You you, you mentioned it specifically Hampson, and and well, if he's there, where does Lofton play, right? Well, why why aren't we worried about you know Prado being on there? Well, well, I mean, for one thing, I mean the 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 person blocking Nick Prado is. Vinny Pasquantino, I suppose, but but well, the bigger look, reason is because Nick Prado has 527 major league plate appearances in which he struck out 204 times. Like I, that's the no, problem. No, I, I don't. I don't. First of all, I agree with your overall assessment. I'm on the exact same page with you. I literally am just asking this as a devil's advocate. My answer to my own question would be because every player is different, and you make your call, right? Like, so, like for us, we haven't seen enough of Nick Lofton to say no go. But if it's all about play the young guys, play the young guys, and so you don't sign a Hampson, you don't sign a Frazier. I'm just kind of harkening back to what we talked about with Joe because I, I always like Joe's perspective, and I always I, – my initial reaction is to want to fight Joe verbally, not – you know, is to like whatever he says, to be like, damn you, Yankee guy. And then I have to catch myself and go, wait a minute. I respect this man's opinion on everything he writes. Don't – you know, you got to you gotta pull back from the fan and analyze things. And so I always like to take a, another look at what he says. And, and so I'm like, okay, am I missing – because I was championing all the signings. And I'm like, am I missing the point? And Hampson was only the really the only one. I mean, they don't have dozens of starters that are out there, um, you know, that they, they you know, that are ready to go at the, at the big league level. But, I mean, I just am like, why, just as a, so that was my jumping off point to just a bigger picture. Why shouldn't Prado play? And you mentioned it. I understand that uh, Vinny Pascantino's there, but that almost is the same story. Why are we letting Vinny Pascantino field? Right? Is anybody have you seen anything from him fielding that makes you think he's going to be a great first baseman? Listen, I sat closer. I mean, well, we're miles away, but I'm about as far away from my computer where your face is as I was from him. And he's like, it's important to me to play defense. I want to be out there. And so you can say, hey, listen, we want to get him signed to a contract if he hits. So we want to make him happy and we want to make sure that bridge. They're, okay, then let's say that. Really, we don't want his defense there, but we got to have his bat. And so we're going to let him play there at this position because we got to make him happy and sign sign a deal. You know what I'm saying? I'm I'm just like, where is the line up? Well, well ultimately, the difference to me is that like defense at first base is nice, but it's not an existential requirement. Making contact is an existential requirement, and ultimately, what it comes down to with Nick Prado is it's the strikeouts. Like you say, well, you know, why why are we so certain? Like Nick, why why are we? eager to give Nick Lofton an opportunity instead of Prado. Um, and the reason is Lofton makes contact. I mean, even in the minors, even in when he had his huge breakout season, uh, Prado struck out 150 times in 2021, just like he did in 2019 and 2018. The strikeouts were always an issue. And we were, the hope was that it would not become more of an issue at the major league level. It did. And that's why, you know, anytime you look at a minor league prospect, no matter how impressive their raw stats are, always got to take a look at that strikeout rate. If it's above 30%, you've got, you you have some issues. Lofton, he's struck, you know, he's, he, in his first pro season, 90 games, he struck out 60 times. In 2022, 98 times in a full season, almost 600 plate appearances. Last year in 88 AAA games, 51 times. Like, Apples and oranges, really. I mean, the guy makes contact. Pasquintino has made excellent contact. In the minors, when Prado was the better prospect, the one thing that really made, you know, intrigued me about Pasquintino over Prado was the contact rate. Given given that the power was similar, but one guy was striking out more than twice as often as the other. So that's my concern. And that's why he has to prove that he has the strikeouts under control, preferably at the minor league level, before I will start to buy in again.
Uh, by the way, we're proudly brought to you by our friends at Gann Asphalt and Concrete. They serve the greater Kansas City metro area. Nationally recognized, full-service paving and pavement maintenance contractor. Parking lot problems, they've been making them disappear in Kansas City since 1994. Don't risk accidents and liability. In your parking lot, get it restriped today. A brightly striped lot will cut down on accidents and keep your parking lot as safe as possible and not have frustrated customers like me. I, the other night, I told the story uh, a couple of weeks ago. I went to dinner right before I went out of town and uh, parked, got out of the car, and then I walk up and I see the sign. It's across the sidewalk. It was a handicapped spot because there was nothing on the ground. Get that on the ground. Kind of get back in the car, go find a new spot. Uh, don't irritate your customers. Call Gan Asphalt and Concrete, 816 484 3338. Find them online at ganasphalt.com. Uh, Randy, I'll go to uh, Blake. Blake's on a roll tonight. Blake, Blake's a good friend of the of the pod. Uh, I'm so excited for the inevitable Frazier Hampson center field platoon. Um, what is your dream for center field? My dream would be that Drew Waters just gets on a heater in April and wins the job with his with his performance, with you know, his power, you know, basically his, his offense, um, and settles in as an you know average, maybe even slightly below average defensive center fielder. But if a guy who can hit twenty to twenty five bombs and hit 280, um, you know, that would be such an enormous upgrade over what the Royals expect from that position. Because right now, center field is their weakest spot on the on the roster. Uh, if you can use Isbell in a, in a fourth outfielder defensive uh, replacement role, um, I think that would be ideal. The wild, wild card would be to see if Nick Lofton ends up in center field. Because he's played there some. And, you know, again, if the bat is there, um, you know, could you get... The, the the offensive performance that you hope from from Waters from a from a you know a different guy, um, possible. And then you know the the uh, there's still there's still hope that Kyle Isbell can improve as a hitter to just below average and not terrible because that glove is elite. Um, all of those would be preferable preferable to me than an Adam Frazier, Garrett Hampson platoon. Hampson Hampson against lefties would not be the uh, the worst thing in the world, but Frazier you know, is stretched defensively and offensively to be a center fielder. And, and you know, he's not getting any younger. So uh, Adam Frazier in center, that that is a bad idea in my opinion. So the roster is currently constructed. My dream scenario would be Kyle Isbell in center field. Uh, it would be Drew Waters taking over in right field. And it, it would be Nelson Velasquez in left field. And because I, th I think what Matt Quattrero, you hire Matt Quattrero, and you talk pitching, if, if that's what you're going to do, then you're going to have to play defense. And that's their better defensive lineup. And so to me, the dream is for the best defensive lineup to also hit. Right. Right. And it doesn't have MJ Melendez anywhere near the outfield, but I give him every reason to, to be better for all the reasons you've stated in previous podcasts, getting, going in, getting a full spring, a full off season to try to be better and work as an outfielder. Uh, I'm, I hope that's the case, but just getting a platoon over there at, at DH to me, sounds like a pretty good idea and making sure you can catch the freaking ball, right? Like, so my dream scenario has the best defensive uh, team that the Royals can put on the field hitting well. Right? I'm not, I, I, I don't, I don't expect, yeah, I don't expect Isbell to suddenly become Ken Griffey Jr., but I'd like him to at least be Devon White, you know, like, I mean, that's for old right. people. He's a very good defensive center fielder and a time gone by, but he, He's like a 220 hitter, but he was so great in center field. I mean, let's go, let's go back just a couple of years. Young Kevin Kiermeyer would be, you know, yeah. the absolute drum. I mean, Kiermeyer, Kiermeyer is one of the best of defensive center fielders of my lifetime. So maybe not that good, but like, you know, a reasonable approximation of that would be amazing. Look, I love your your outfield. I think it's more likely they're gonna carry 12 pitchers than that because Hunter Renfro was signed to wow. play. And that's the problem. And this is again, it's like the Royals made all these signings, some of them were actually improve the team. Some of them were more motion than progress. I will, it, it, to the degree that all of those signings created a vibe that encouraged Bobby Witt to sign a long-term extension, they're worthwhile. But Hunter Renfro, I just worry that he is not going to hit very well. And the defense is already in decline and he's like 32 now. Um, and like I said, it's not like the Royals have a great defensive left fielder either. So you almost have to go with a Kyle Lewis Bell in center field just because you need a center fielder who's going to have to make up for the inadequacies on both outfield corners. 
Um, and so I think for that reason alone, I think Isbell is probably going to have to start the season getting the bulk of the innings out there. And that's fine. So, yes, if Drew Waters hits, maybe he doesn't play center. Maybe he plays one of the corners. Maybe they put Renfro at DH sometimes or Melendez at DH sometimes um, and improve the defense that way. What are you thinking for the uh, fifth starter, Rainey? What are we- <laughs> you know what I'm thinking, Saran. Um, I, I, what I will say is, is that- Are you still thinking Daniel Lynch? No, actually, I mean, maybe, but what's, uh, what I find very Why? interesting. What, what have you seen? Velocity's down again. Velocity's or- about where it was last year. It's not great. but Which look- was down. Okay, and with the down velocity, he was still more effective than the incumbent number five starter last year. He's five years younger than the incumbent number five starter from last year. But uh, my point uh, is, no, no, don't don't put him up. Nobody's plan is Jordan Lyles. Not mine. The Royals plan was <laughs> they, well, that's why they didn't give him a two-year, seventeen million dollar deal. Not be the plan. But well, I, 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 I want to turn this to a good thing. He hasn't won the job. I give the Royals credit. Andy Rogers has reported. It is a three-way battle, and the dark horse here is the guy who I really like, but I thought would be more of a bullpen guy, and that's Alec Marsh. If right. Alec Marsh can win that role, I think you talk about like things that the Royals can do between now and opening day that might improve their playoff odds. Get you know if Alec Marsh can earn that role. So, so um, I, let's let's come back. I come excited. back. I come back to the question: What do you want? Right, and so you immediately went to Lynch, which to me is somewhat rooting. You brought up Lynch. I was going to say, actually, I'm I'm okay with Lynch, but if 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 Alec Marsh wins it with his performance and his stuff, I think that would be very exciting. My concern with Marsh is he could lose the strike zone, and he's done that before. Like he's there's a he has a highest ceiling of those three by far, but he he also has a pretty low floor, whereas Lynch has a lower ceiling, but at least he throws strikes. But if Marsh can throw strikes, I, you know, and, and you go into the sea, if he wins that job and with the acknowledgement that if he struggles in his first couple of starts, he, he's going to lose that role and have to try somebody else. But if they go into the season with him in that role, I think that's a very exciting development for the organization. Yeah. Listen, in comments says Lyles gave up four homers in a row. Uh, Curtis said, for the love of God, anyone is a fifth starter besides Lyles. And Matt, oh Lordy, here comes a 17 minute discussion on Lyles. Uh, it's it's that's not going to happen. Um, uh, and then came was talking about Devon White. There's a lot of love for Devon White, so I found a guy uh, that everybody loves. Um, you no, know, there's not going to be because I, I think it, I want to be clear. Jordan Lyles was not the Royals' plan. I mean, I've had the discussions with them. They ended up the the plan was Daniel Lynch. The plan was Chris Bubich. The plan was Brady Singer. The plan was uh, Jackson Coar. And then, you know, you were one of the ones that used to like the phrase, no battle plan survives combat, right? Like, now you got to do something. So, to me, where I really wanted to go was Alec Marsh. I don't see squat out of Daniel Lynch. Nothing. There's nothing that excites me out of Daniel Lynch uh, right now. Nine strikeouts and 13 innings, uh, nine hits, five walks. I mean, the numbers aren't terrible. They're not. Again, spring training stats, yeah. The strikeouts, you'd like them to be higher. Ultimately... I'm, based on what he did last year, his stuff was a little down, but his command was better. But but his but heart rate training was very good. I'm with you that like especially listen. I'm preparing for a fantasy league, and years ago, early in my days, ooh, you know, Patrick Lennon has you know seven home runs in the spring. I got to get this guy right. Like I, I I understand that, but when you have competitions, you're not out there. Daniel Lynch is not out there. This is not the Ryan. If anyone watched the game today, the game was on. Uh, today and and Lefevre said uh, told the story of Zach Greinke when he just got obliterated one spring training game and said well he came out they're like what are you doing he said well there are guys in the clubhouse who told me I could survive on just my fastball or guys in the organization I, I he may have said clubhouse but I I come to find out there were guys in the organization telling him you could survive on just your fastball so he's like oh yeah well here it is and he threw his fastball every time. Oh, Zach Greinke was a proven commodity at that point. He was making a point. Other guys would go out there and go, okay, I'm going to throw, I'm going to, I've got a new grip on a change. I'm going to throw it again and again and again. That's not where Daniel Lynch is. It's not where Alec Marsh is. Two guys are out there competing for a spot in the rotation. One guy's kicking ass and one guy's not. To me, this this is not a conversation about Jordan Lyles. This is a conversation about Alec Marsh, in my opinion. And at what point does Daniel Lynch have to really produce? Alec Marsh has blown him away, right? Can we agree on that? I mean, I, maybe his stuff is better. I don't know in terms of performance, he's blown Daniel Lynch away, but it's, I think we're not arguing over Alec Marsh. We both agree he's exciting potential, 
But, you know, he's also been extremely exasperating even in the minor leagues. I mean, it was two years ago. He had an area of like seven in double A, even though he led the organization in strikeouts. Um, but we Why would you mention if, your, it's a new or it's a new regime? It's right. New well, people, if coaches. he puts it all together, we think that he could be good. But I mean, he has he still there is a potential for him to fall off a cliff. I think the argument here is simply you've written off Daniel Lynch entirely. I'm not saying Daniel Lynch is an, an ace or even a number four starter, but I'm not just writing him off. Like the guy has a pedigree. He's lost a mile on the, an hour on his fastball, not five, but like a mile, maybe a mile and a half, which is not that unusual for a pitcher in his late twenties. Um, I'm, I'm willing to play, <laughs> wait and see. Just that's the, that's the real kick in the ass for me. How old is Alec Marsh now? He's not that much younger than Lynch. To be oh, I know. Honest. He's like 26, maybe? Uh, 25. 25, okay. Uh, born uh, 514 of 98. Yeah, so this is his age 26. He'll be 26 in two months. Yeah, so he'll and be 26 in two months. And he just made the major leagues last year. And he had a 569 ERA, a 570 FIP. Like, again, it's like Alec Marsh still has a lot to prove. He's not anything approaching an established major league commodity. And Daniel Lynch was born 11 17 of 1996. Yeah, so about 18 months older. Yeah. Okay. What? Eighteen months. Yes. And he's also been in the major leagues for three years. I mean, that's your bigger argument. That I just, I, 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 we're talking about a guy trying to establish himself, and you just talked about how he's he's already on the downslope of. His well, career. I mean, I yes, was, but, listen. I ran the numbers last year. I did it. He's absolutely on the downslope of his career. Like the the big years for for pitchers across the board, two hundred strikeout years all come for the most part early on in in careers, and then tail down i mean like he is I, that's my point is he is in the downslope and to me alec marsh we take both these guys yes they've had their trials and tribulations but there's a new regime a new approach one's taking to it one's not I, th there's a reason to not play alec marsh but if alec marsh isn't ready at 25 years old he's never going to be ready and he is to me i he's, think he's absolutely ready to be in the major leagues i just question is it as a starter or as a reliever i hope that he shows enough to say it's as a starter I also think that the line between starter, quote unquote, and reliever, quote unquote, is grayer than it used to be. There is that range, you know, that range of a guy who who's maybe a three inning guy, a once through the order, you guy that you 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 know you can't really use him as a starter in today's game, but you have an opener and then you let him throw three or four innings. That might be the ideal role, or if you can't quite get twice through the lineup, five innings every time out, but you're more valuable than just a one inning guy. You could give 110 innings out of a pitcher, you know, throwing three to four innings every fifth day. You know, teams need to show a little more flexibility with the roles they give guys. I think that could be Alec Marsh's future if the Royals will let him. Yeah, and, I, and, I, and I'm fine. I just, listen, on the part of, because I know I'm always painted as the Jordan Lyles guy, I if they put Alec Marsh on the mound and Jordan Lyles in the bullpen, thrilled. I'm thrilled. Because to me, I, I'm going to believe in what they preach. And I know velocity is important as much as old time guys don't want to think it is. I, I, I like if you're not, if you guys have, have turned, you guys being the Royals new staff, have turned the Alec Marsh corner with him this spring. We'll see if it takes in the big leagues. But right now, he appears to be responding to whatever it is you've instructed him to do. And if you don't believe in it, who should? Alec Marsh is a great test case for the new regime. He was, we said that last year, and to their credit, he got to the major leagues after a terrible 2022 um, and, you know, showed flashes. I mean, he wasn't great, but he was better in major leagues last year than he was in double A the year before. So yeah. that's a good sign, but he needs to make another step forward. And he's always, you know, ever since they drafted him and he came, he came out of the draft with better stuff than advertised. The stuff has always been there. Um, Oh, wait, you God. want to show us your your tattoo there, Soren? <laughs> Turn have... around, let's see it. Soren has a Lyles tattoo on his back, like Sons of Anarchy style <laughs> gang tat. <laughs> That's fantastic. It's been a strong night for the comments. You see any surprises coming on the roster? So yeah, let's let's finish before we get to the Hall of Fame with the bullpen, right? That's the one area we haven't talked about. And if there's going to be a, a surprise, it's probably there. So okay, we we mentioned because Carlos Sanchez is not going to make the opening day roster. John McMillan is not. The guys. Now, everyone else, you know, the, the veterans they signed, Will Smith, uh, Nick Anderson, who, again, Nick Anderson's a guy who's always pitched well, but has always had trouble staying healthy. He's been healthy as far as I can tell. That's a good sign. So he'll be on the opening day roster. Chris Stratton, 
um and uh and john schreiber the guy they they, they traded for uh you know with the, with the red sox those four guys are there james mcarthur has been pitching very well that's five and then matt sauer rule five pick there was no guarantee that he'd pitch well enough in spring training to make the team so far, all systems seem to be go for him, too. Like, uh, I don't expect him to be great, but it looks like he'll make the roster. So that's six. But that leaves two open spots in the bullpen. Um, and currently, the only lefty in there is Will Smith. So I have a feeling, strong feeling, there'll be another lefty in there. It could be Daniel Lynch, right? It could be Alec Marr. Like, I figure one of those two, either uh, either um, uh, Lynch or Alec Marsh may be in the bullpen. Unless it's Jordan Lyles, that would be the great. That would be a really nice surprise because I do think he could be an asset there. But that still leaves one spot, and I wonder if it's going to be a, a real long shot NRI left-handed reliever Sam Long, who's who has pitched I think for the Giants and for the A's the last couple of years, but was just a, a you know a, a non-roster, non-forty-man player, you know, signed as a minor league free agent, who has. Some major league experience that hasn't been terrible. 4.92 ERA in his career, 128 innings, um, and has had a very good spring training. You know, it. I, I don't want to put too much emphasis on what a huge surprise it would be if he makes the roster, because ultimately, if he does and he pitches three bad innings, he'll be in, he'll be back in Omaha and they'll bring someone else up. They have a number of options for that spot, but I think if there's going to be a real surprise, it's going to be but that last spot of the bullpen. Yeah, I think so as well. I just can't find it on the position players on on what they're going to shock us with. Uh, there might be a good thing. Like the, the the roster is what they expected it to be. Nobody has, you know, played so poorly and, and that they've opened up a spot. Nobody, none of their. I mean, it'd be nice if one of their prospects just blew them away. But it's not like some. It's not like even what last year was it Matt Duffy and you know they 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 just had so many open roster spots that an NRI could make the team. Um, you know, as an everyday or as a position player who, who played a fair amount. Uh, this year, they have enough depth internally. They signed free agents in the offseason. On the offensive side, I think they're going to be solid. Uh, all right, let's finish with this. By the way, we're proudly brought to you by our friends at GAN Asphalt and Concrete. Free consultations, no commissions. Crews, they're in house crews. Every project comes with a written warning. GAN Asphalt keeps parking lots safer, helps you and your business avoid unnecessarily, uh, unnecessary delays uh, and costly expenses. GAN Asphalt and Concrete, one contractor, all things parking lot. Find them online at ganasphalt.com. Uh, Royals added three to the Hall of Fame. They went to a veterans committee. Do you like the veterans committee idea? I mean, yeah, it's funny because when you think about the the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, the Veterans Committee is, you know, has been uh, the 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 weeping paper cut of that institution since it was founded. It's always why is this different then? Well, just the quality of people they're 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 voting in. I mean, this class, this three man class, might be the best Hall of Fame class the Royals have ever inducted. The only reason I'm not sure it is is because George Brett went in by himself, and George Brett by himself is better than any three three uh, other people you could pick. Um, but you know, some of this is this this draft class in particular. It's not simply oh somebody became eligible. It's not like oh Eric Hosmer is eligible now. We you know he's qualified clearly. We should let him in. No, this is righting the wrongs of the past. This is filling in the gaps in the Royals Hall of Fame that have existed in some cases for decades, all three of these guys for very different reasons are not just worthy of being honored in the Royals hall of fame, but are, have been frankly oversights um, in some cases, gross oversights for a long time. And I am very pleased. I've made the case for all of these guys um, in the past. And I no longer have to make that case because that, that wrong has been righted. I, uh, I have a fundamental problem with veterans committees and full disclosure i'm on this veterans committee and so but i will tell you and and if if asked to like i always say like i consider this like my watch on kansas city sports and so if there's anything i can do to contribute to it i will do it i would i'm thrilled that i was picked i consider it an honor and i and something that i felt like yeah absolutely you want me to do it i have to do it if you're offering it i absolutely have to do it um but in general, I don't like the idea of veterans committees. You set up the Hall of Fame parameters, and it's like we induct them this way. And if a guy goes through the process and doesn't make it, he didn't make it. That's the whole point 
of a Hall of Fame. It's not the Hall of Good. It's not the Hall of Very Good. It's not the Hall of Guys we really liked. It's not the Hall of Guys who got us on Sports Center a lot, which we'll talk to talk about in a minute. It's it's the Hall of Fame. It's the best of the best, and we have a criteria and how we do it. And if somebody doesn't get selected, I hate that every Hall of Fame. The moment they look around, there's like, oh, we kind of like this guy, or we, oh, we're going to change the rules. That's what makes it. I, baseball makes mistakes on their Hall of Fame. We all think that, right? Whether they did or didn't, I don't know. But they're the best of the bunch because they don't let the whole world in. I got millions of problems with how the NFL does their whole thing because their whole committee, they've got like this, they're, they're, they're maximizing the number of people that they can get in. And so they wait to vote guys in because we need to get this guy in because he's on his last one. I hate that. And I also am not a believer in if he's not a Hall of Famer the first time up, why is he a Hall of Famer 10 years later? Right. I hate when people come on to the vote. Right. That that being said, you're right, in my opinion, about Talis and Sherholtz. I think their contributions are I, I you look through at what they did in building the and particularly Talis. And I and I did a lot of digging. I think Talis got kind of sideways with Mr. K. That's part of that is my understanding. Because I mean this again, since I was a, a kid becoming the, the Royals fan that I am, like like late eighties, early nineties, it was like why is this why is this guy who basically you know built the worlds into the most successful expansion franchise maybe ever not in the hall and my understanding was there was some sort of falling out between him and Ewing Kaufman in the 70s um and that certainly would have explained it up until the moment that Ewing Kaufman passed away but that was 25 years ago actually 30 years ago now um so that was a little little strange I want to say I do want to make one point though about how you're saying you know these that the, there's a process in place and they these guys didn't get in the thing is the Royals really didn't have a process in place at least that involved voting like the the current process now where fans have a vote people you know there's a there's a process for players to be inducted that process was only started about 15 years ago i, I remember writing about it in the late aughts so my point is all and all of these people we're talking about now predated that i'm not sure that Bo, Bo jackson was ever on the ballot maybe he was at the very the beginning of this new process but certainly when he retired there was never a chance for the fo- the fans to vote on whether or not he should be inducted i suspect that if there was he would have been in- inducted the other thing though is even at the national level executives are not there is the only way for them to get in is through a veterans committee. Maybe that process should change. But you know, Derek Jeter gets voted on by the, the Baseball Writers Association of America. Pat Gillick or you know eventually Dave Dombrowski or whoever, they do not, right? Their only process is this way. So in in my understanding is with the Royals, if you're an executive, this is the way you get in. And the, the thinking is the fans don't have as much uh understanding of what an executive is doing and who's good and who's not whether or not that's fair i don't know but i i think that's uh, certainly a valid point that the only way these guys are going to get in at all is through a veterans committee but the point is if you're gonna have a veterans committee it better be a, a good one not one that is letting in people because they're their favorites of of, the, of one of the guys on the committee like harold baines getting voted into the baseball hall of fame because tony la Russa was on the committee and you know was was very fond of harold baines who played for him um so the veterans committee here yourself included i think did a, a very good job um you it sounds like you're not as big on having bo jackson in the hall and uh, bo jackson is the guy where the quality of the player and the the quality of the phenomenon are vastly vastly different right. um and, and, and let me let me say this uh you know jeff said you brought right the wrongs uh right the wrongs perfect right? i think that that was good uh, comments of what about players like Barry Bonds? Let me just say that I, I do think like the baseball hall of fame will one day have a veterans committee that will put in Barry Bonds, Roger Clemens, all that. It, it, that's asinine. It's, it's been said for years, doesn't need to be said again. And it's, it's ridiculous that they don't. And that is, that is a perfect reason to say, okay, we're going to have a committee and go do it. So I wanted to, to, to mention that, but Bo went through the process, right. And, and, like I feel like Bo Jackson, like I feel about um, Buck O'Neill. I'm thrilled Bo Jackson's in there. I was a huge Bo Jackson fan. I remember arguing with friends of mine in college, being you know talking Bo Jackson, you know stuff. I remember where I was sitting when my friend came in and told me that Bo Jackson's 
the Royals were releasing Bo Jackson. I'm like, what? What the hell are you talking about? Right? Like, I, I mean, it was, it was, it was one of the one of the more traumatic memories I have of sports. Right? Like, uh, me too. It, it was, it was awful. And I am thrilled for Bo Jackson being there. As I was thrilled that Buck O'Neill was I- I- inducted into the Hall of Fame, I wouldn't have voted for Buck O'Neill. I didn't vote for Bo Jackson. Right? Because. I mean, and, and I'll give you just the, and, and, but I, I, but this is not a campaign. This is horrendous. They had a process. It was a fair vote and he was in, and I am thrilled that Bo Jackson is in, but I, but I just, it, when we're going through the process, it, it, his, his batting average, his hits, like where did he's, he's like in, in Royals history, he's 460th in hits. He's 66th in doubles. He's 14th in triples. He's 109th in home runs. He's 278th in runs. He's 313th in RBIs, 81st in stolen bases, uh, 881st in, in – uh, no, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm giving you I'm, the – Yeah, I'm looking, those are the okay. counting numbers. I was say, he's 100, he has 109 home runs. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm going through the – I got it wrong. He currently ranks – I'm sorry. 39th in average, uh, 43rd in hits, 57th in doubles, 41st in triples, 15th in home runs, 33 in runs scored, 27th in RBIs, 18th in stolen bases, uh, 32nd in total bases, uh, 30. Fifth in um, on base, uh, fifth in slugging, thirteenth in OPS, and forty seventh in games played. Well, ultimately, the forty seventh in games played is goes a long way to explaining a lot of the other <laughs> stuff. But he, but, but more fundamentally, Bo Jackson was not inducted into the World Hall of Fame because of his stats. Bo Jackson, and he is, and I completely agree with your point that, like, based on the quality of his play. Was he worthy of being inducted? No, probably not. In terms of just wins above replacement, as a Royal, he had 7.0. That is about half the established standard for a Royals player. The only Royals Hall of Famer is anywhere close. Do you want to know? Actually, there's one There's one guy in the Royals Hall of Fame who had, in terms of career value, was basically exactly as, as good as Bo Jackson. You any idea who that might be? Like the least qualified Royals Hall of Famer. Based least on qualified Royals Hall of Hall Famer. Famer. Based, based on his the paperwork here, I've got. It's not. It's actually not close. He's kind of like the, all alone. Obviously. If I could bring up here, uh, I'm scrolling through the names. I wish I had them in just a. You're not going to say how, are you? No, 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 no. Freddie. Nope. Freddie actually the defense and speed at shortstop. Freddie grades out as Sweeney. No. Cookie Rojas. Cookie Rojas. Okay. Cookie Rojas, yep. fan favorite, was was one of the first, he might have been the first position player inducted um, into the Royals Hall of Fame when they first created it. Played for a long time, but was just not a very, you know, was not a very productive player. By the end, he was just kind of replacement level. Um, he had 7.2 wins above replacement, right there with Bo Jackson. But again, the point I want to make is Bo Jackson is a singular player, not just really in Royals history or Kansas City history, but really almost national in the sense that as a quality of play, not worthy. But in my lifetime, how many Kansas City-based athletes were the most, have a, have a claim to be at any point in their career, the most famous athlete in America prior to 2018? Because <laughs> right now, we're, we live in this bizarre world where the two most famous athletes in America today are both played for Kansas City, uh, a Kansas City team. But in my lifetime, the only players I could think of, and and I'm uh, George Brett, I would say in the summer of 1980, when he was chasing after 400, I would say George Brett was the most famous, most talked about athlete in America. You maybe could make a case at some point Tom Watson, although I think that's really kind of stretching it. But, you know, is it just to be, as a golfer, I'm not sure he ever got to that level. But Tom Watson, maybe. And then there's Bo Jackson. And Bo Jackson, in 1989 and 1990, when he, you know, he led off the All-Star game with a home run and Nike put out their Bo Nose commercials. Um, I mean, this is before Michael Jordan won his first championship. Once Michael Jordan won his first championship in, I think, 91, and obviously Bo, by that point, Bo had torn his hip. Um, but there was that two-year gap, uh, you know, span there where I think Bo Jackson was clearly the most famous athlete in America. And he happened to play most of his, you know, at least in the summers in Kansas City. So I get it. I'm not saying I, I completely, you, you absolutely can make a case he does not, he's not worthy of induction based on the quality of his play. I think that if you're telling the story of the Kansas City Royals, 
And if that's what a Hall of Fame is for, you can't tell the story of the franchise without bringing up Bo Jackson. And so for that reason, I'm good with it. But Absolutely. he's the controversial one. The other two, I think, are no-brainers. And and for that reason, I'm good with it. But I, I believe that the Hall of Fames need somebody who's tough on some of the voting because I think it's too much of a popularity contest. And for that reason, I voted no. It was hard. And I and I remember going through it when he was on the ballot before and, and agonizing over it. I would tell you that Bo Jackson, Kevin Seitzer, and um, uh, Al Fitzmorris are the three toughest guys I've had to say no to. Right? And it's it sucks because I'd like, I, you know, I'd be thrilled for all three of those guys to be in there. Um, but they, they were the, they were the three toughest ones. And, and I think, you know, to your point, I think this is a good one. A comment says Bo Jackson and Patrick Mahomes talking about, we we're talking about the most famous guys. I've described Patrick Mahomes as he's Len Dawson because the quarterback has to be part of it. And Lenny was a great quarterback and he's a great quarterback. He's George Brett in the sense that he's a bona fide MVP and one of if not the best player in the game while he's playing. And he's Bo Jackson because he's the sports center lead, right? He does things that make you go, did you see that? Right. And Bo Jackson is not Patrick Mahomes. Patrick Mahomes is far superior to Bo Jackson. But Bo Jackson had that quality of Patrick Mahomes. And whether it's throwing Harold Reynolds out from the wall in Seattle, um, you know, whether it's running up the run uh, up and down the wall in Baltimore, I think it was. Mm -hmm. Um, or whether it's running, you know, over Brian Bosworth and into the tunnel and, you know, oh. where where, where, where that Seattle or wherever. I mean, that's, that's the point on a pure, on a per game yes. basis. So Bo Jackson was up there in terms of highlights per game with any, with any athlete in American history. So, um, yeah, I, I look, we, 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 we both see the, the, the reasons to put him in and the reasons not to. It's just a matter of how much emphasis you want to put on either one. But yeah. to me, like Sherholz, I was actually, I was kind of, maybe because I've been so focused on the Cedric Callis stuff, I didn't realize Sherholz wasn't in the hall already. I mean, he was the general manager of the team that won the World Series. Like, that's think, that seems like a pretty... Uh, I, I think the backstory on that one is there was some frustration when he left. I don't I, think I could see that, especially when he, he, was, he leaves and then wins 14 champion divisions in a row in Atlanta. Because uh, I, I, I was here when he was the general manager and, and he was kind of a sour guy and in he left and, and I left for a few years. And then when I came back in 99 and that conversation would come up and, and there were people that were like, well, yeah, he saw that the team was on the downslope. He had taken him to the downslope right. and he jumped out and grabbed a team that did, Bobby Cox had just stocked the system and then rode that wave. So I think there were some sour grapes. And I think there is a, there is a, that case that, you know, he, that he might've been responsible for the downswing, but in addition to winning the title, let's not forget, he presided over a, a kind of a, a rebuild on the fly in the, in the, in the 1984 range that people don't give enough credit to him. I mean, this was the 85 team that won the world series was nothing like that. The team that was dominating the American league West from 76 to 1980, that by 1982-83, the pitching was completely shot. And, you know, they in the span of you know, one season, they bring up Brett Saberhagen, Danny Jackson, and Mark Gubazal. He gets Charlie Lebrant for nothing in the trade. Bud Black brought in and basically, like, rebuilt a rotation in, like, a year. That, you know, so there he it's more than just, oh, he just happened to be the, the general manager when they won the World Series. He, he made some very good moves, but you're right. He, the, the way he left... I think left a bitter taste in some people's mouths and probably was the reason why it took this long for him to get it. There's also an element of what you, you know, Joe Sheehan and you, have, you and I have both had to reluctantly, it, it, not to the degree that Joe Sheehan says it, but that the 14 and 15 Royals were maybe lucky. I, I, I hate that term. I don't believe in luck, but I mean, I, I think it's just a random nature of, of, you know, small sample baseball uh, that happens in the playoffs. But you, you know, if, if somebody, if you're going to ding the, four, you know, Dayton Moore for his time here and say, well, you know, I mean, look at all, all around it. I mean, he obviously just got lucky there. There's another one of that with Sherholtz too. Sure. But I mean, I, I fully expect Dayton Moore is going to be in the Royals Hall of Fame. And he really only has those two years. Whereas, you know, Sherholtz has a, a bigger legacy than just, you know, one good season. I mean, he had more winning seasons in eight years than Dayton Moore had in 15 or whatever. Um, let me finish really quickly with Cedric Tallis, because I do think that the problem there is his, people don't know who that is. He was the original general manager of this team. And remember, the Royals started in 1969. By 1971, they were above 500 in their third year as an expansion franchise. No free agency, 
the only way to build was through the expansion draft and and through the draft, which in two years, you're not going to have anybody come up in the draft, really. I think Splitorf came up that year, but that was it. And trades. Cedric Talent, I did the, uh, a long series on the world's, the, the greatest trades in Royals history for the Athletic five years ago. Right? The 20 greatest trades in Royals history. Four of the top six trades the Royals have ever made were made by Cedric Talent in a five-year span before he was let go in 1974. All right. The very quickly here, the number six trade, just so you, th these names may, you bring a bell for you and me, some of the younger people may not remember them. He traded uh, two guys you've never heard of for John Mayberry. That was, that was in December of 1971. The rumors he got the GM of the Astros, they were, they got basically waited for him to get drunk and then, and then uh, badgered him until he made the trade. The year before at the winter meetings in 1970, he traded Bob Johnson, who had just had a good season. He was on one of our all-time teams as a star, as starter. First of all, to strike out 200 batters in a season, but never had anything remotely approaching that success again. Um, in a six-player trade, he got Freddie Patek. And Patek was a starting shortstop for a decade. The number three trade of Royals history, he traded Roger Nelson, just coming off, who was on, I think, my team, because he just had the best ERA in Royals history, 280 ERA. Never came anything close to that again for Al McRae. And then the number one trade, the best trade in Royals history, he traded Joe Foy, the third baseman on the expansion Royals in 1969, who never had another good season in the major leagues, for Amos Otis. And this is what I wrote. Uh, here we go. I want to re re put up the numbers here. If you add the six trades together, he also had two other trades in the top 20. I, won't, I don't have to re recount those, but he got Lou Pinella in a trade. Uh, and... Uh, Cookie Rojas, we just mentioned, in trades for where he gave up like nothing in return. Add those six trades together, the Royals gave up 11 players who would combine for 6.7 war in the rest of their careers. The 10 players they got in return combined for 134.9. That is a net gain of 128 war, which is more than Ted Williams' entire career. All right. In those six trades, Talis did not give up a single player who would go on to have even three more war in his career while acquiring five Royals Hall of Famers, Otis, Rojas, Patek, Mayberry, and McRae in five years. And I finished by saying this. So we'll end this series the only way that feels appropriate by asking the fine people that run this fine organization to finally correct a historic oversight and to please induct Cedric Talis into the Royals Hall of Fame. The glorious history of this franchise would not be nearly so glorious without him. And today I can say, thanks to that fine committee, including you, Seren, that Cedric Tallis is finally a member of the Royals Hall of Fame, um, along with so many of the players that he brought into the organization. So, um, you know, they, 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 there is a glorious history to this team, uh, and I'm hoping that they will start building on that glory again this season. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Well said. Well said, Randy. All right, that's going to do it for us. Remember, we're always brought to you by our friends at Gann Asphalt and Concrete. One contractor, all things parking lot, uh, in-house crews. Every project comes with a written warranty. I'll let Gann make your parking lot problems go away. They've been doing it since 1994, 30 years. Gann Asphalt and Concrete. Find them online at gannasphalt.com. For the good Dr. Randy Gisarelli, I'm Soren Petro saying, oh, by the way, uh, roster projection. Uh, coming up for next week, right? We'll give Roster our projections, predictions, surprises. You know, it's our our big our big pre you know before the season blowout uh, preview. How bold will we be? We'll find out uh, next week, right here on the Coffin Corner Podcast. <laughs>